This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is apologies. I have three experts who've written about this subject in modern life, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Apologies is the subject of this show and why it seems to be a fading art, if you will, in modern life. I have three people who have written about this subject. I'm going to introduce them uh, and let them talk about their viewpoints on it. The first guest is Edwin Battistella. Is that how you pronounce it, Edwin? Battistella, yeah. Battistella, okay, okay. It's more Goomba then. <laughs> okay, so, exactly. okay. so uh, if you could uh, just give me a little bit of background about yourself personally, as well as what interested you in apologies, and what the subject uh, and title of your book is about. Sure, uh, my name's Ed Battistella. Uh, I'm a linguist by training. And I've always been interested in how people do things with words. Um, a few years ago, I got interested in some of the um, bad apologies that I was seeing on television. And I, I thought it would be interesting to write a book that combines some of the theory of apologizing with some actual examples um, ripped from the headlines, as it were. Um, so I did a book in 2014 called Sorry About That. The language of public apology, um, and it, it talks about uh, roughly a hundred public apologies and how they worked, or in many cases didn't work. And uh, in in the book, does it focus mainly just on public apologies or interpersonal stuff too? Because I would think that people who are apologizing in public probably act a bit differently than they do in their personal lives. Yeah, exactly. I talk a little bit about the difference between a personal apology and a public apology and the, the, the sincerity factor that in a personal apology, you can look the person in the eye and see if they're fidgeting and, and get a sense of whether they mean it. Um, often in public apologies, the language does a lot of that work. Okay. Well, The Age of Apology is Mark Gibney's book uh, that he uh, uh, co-edited. Uh, uh, and so, Mark, if you could tell me a little bit of background about yourself, as well as what drew you to write about apology. Yeah, so, I, so my field is human rights. I teach human rights. I, I teach at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. I'm also associated with the Raoul Wallenberg Institute in, uh, in Lund, Sweden. And I saw, it was something that happened in the late 1990s where President Clinton uh, apologized to, in Guatemala, for the U.S. support of the the genocide, and that sort of interested me in sort of this relatively, well, not even relatively, this new phenomenon of state leaders issuing an apology for their actions. So I wrote a piece in Human Rights Quarterly called uh, something like the status of state apologies. What's the meaning of state apologies in international law? And then after that was the book, The Age of Apology. Uh, and as I said, I was I saw this as a means of addressing human rights violations from the past. Well, Cindy France also has a book called Better Late Than Early, The Influence of Timing on Apology Effectiveness. Cindy, if you could give a little background about yourself and what specifically your book is about. Sure. I'm a social psychologist, and so I'm looking at a really different level of analysis, looking at uh, interactions between individuals as opposed to um, states or public apologies. And um, this research was inspired, actually, by a student who uh, I teach a course on social conflict, and she came in and told a story about getting an apology too soon and just not being ready for it. And so that, that sparked um, research on what is the best way to apologize. Um, when we talk about apologies, obviously we're talking about someone has transgressed in some way, presumably against another person. Uh, let me go back just sort of to the evolutionary roots of uh, what uh, uh, the social interactions would have caused humans to apologize, because obviously we are of simian stock, and uh, everything I've ever read about the evolution of human beings says that deceit, cunning, are actually good evolutionary adaptations, and yet uh, it seems as we got to be more civilized, some of these things which may have worked when we were the monkey in charge of uh, the banana grove and doling out might not be so good uh, as we have become civilized uh, through the agricultural revolution. So is, is the art of apology or apologizing something that is relatively recent? 
And is it something that, evolutionarily speaking, we shouldn't expect human beings to be that good at? Uh, Edwin, maybe if I start with you. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert on uh, uh, simians or evolutionary biology, but um, one of the things that I, I noticed was that apologies really seem to go back in history for quite a long time. You've got um, um, Rousseau's apology, um, St. Augustine's apologies. Um, Alexander Hamilton apologized um, for having an affair years ago, um, at sort of the beginning of the Republic. So I think, you know, when I think about this, I think of some of the work of uh, Irving Goffman, who talks about um, the way that uh, people can kind of reinvent themselves in a community. So the, maybe the, um, if I had to guess, I would think that the sort of adaptive advantage of apologies is that it allows people to kind of re-enter a community after they've created an offense. Uh, Mark, uh, do you have any ideas about sort of the evolutionary pros and cons of apologies? Well, as I said earlier, that that in terms of international relations, I don't think it existed before the 1990s. And that to me is one of the unique features of it. And certainly on a personal level, it's happened from time immemorial, right? But in terms of the relations between states, it just didn't happen. I mean, states didn't apologize for transgressions that they had committed. So what was interesting to me is you suddenly had this change from no apologies to a situation where the, expect the expectation now seems to be always apologize, right? And there are certain people who did it better in terms of the United States. Certainly Clinton apologized more than Bush, but even the Bush apology was interesting, particularly after Abu Ghraib. Uh, and, and then you have this charge by the Trump administration, or, or Donald Trump when he was a candidate, that Obama has spent eight years apologizing. Well, I, not really, but so this is the blowback from this apology phenomenon. So again, I, I think it's different on the political level than it is on the personal level. How about you, yeah. Uh, Cindy? Yeah, I would agree with that. And so as a psychologist, thinking about the very personal level, um, I think that uh, anytime people are benefiting evolutionarily from living in social groups, there's got to be some mechanism for, as, as Edwin says, coming back into the community after you've transgressed. And, you know, even a dog can look like they're sorry. Um, and uh, from my perspective, I think humans really evolved these really strong, um, I'm going to call them social motives, um, just as strong as biological motives to try to maintain their status in the group because being a group member for our, our ancestors probably would have been the difference between life and death. And so um, you see these very, very strong motivations to, um, to belong, um, to connect. And I think that, that those motivations um, are probably pretty hardwired and, and also uh, would be very much involved in driving the desire to, to apologize, to reestablish your membership in the group. And let, let me just bring uh, to light that there's a difference between what we colloquially call an apology and something like an apologia within a debate or when we talk about Christian apologists defending uh, biblical principles or whatnot, uh, was that always such a wide divide, or ha has the idea of a personal apology, you know, I cheated on my wife, I didn't pay my taxes, I was, uh, I kicked my dog when he yipped too hard, uh, ha is that more of a recent phenomenon in the last few centuries, that the personal apology rather than the more formal apologia? I guess it's not. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. My guess is that, that um, if we could travel back in time to those very early social groups, that, that people were apologizing to. Uh, Mark or Eddie? Yeah, I think there are some, some nice early examples, and a lot of the, the sort of um, etymology of apologia really sort of you know starts out with a like defense for one's actions and eventually evolves into kind of excuse making and then actual contrition. So there's probably a, a sort of line of change that goes along with the, uh, the etymology a little bit. Uh, Mark, do you have a comment? Yeah, no, I, but one of the things I would, that 
this conversation is leading me to think about. And when I said earlier, I thought that the, the apology was not the expectation, was in terms of how public apologies are. That perhaps at some time, in, in older times, the, 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 the apology, particularly since it's a, public, it's a transgression between two people, is a private affair. It seems to be one of the things that, that I seem to notice is that it's moved into the public sphere. Right, so apologies now are expected to be done publicly, otherwise they almost don't seem to uh, qualify as apologies. I mean, even the, when I mentioned before about George Bush, George W. Bush with the Abu Ghraib, I mean, his apology for that was, it was done, for, that was done privately he, with the King of Jordan, of all people. Jordan has nothing to do with this, but he, then they come out to the Rose Garden where he announces that Privately, he had apologized in the Oval Office, and then he, you know, the few bad apples kind of thing. But again, there always now seems to be this public manifestation of so many apologies, and I think that is one of the things that has 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 differed over time. Well, I want to uh, go through each of uh, your premises in each of your books and then get the others to comment on it since uh, you all have slightly different takes on it. Let me start with Edwin. Your book uh, is called, sorry about that, The Language of Public Apology. So uh, do you differentiate, say, the language of the private versus the public? And what about the public apology, the language? Are we talking about the classic non-apology that has become de rigueur of the last few decades? Yeah, what I did was I, I looked at um, uh, lots of different apologies and tried to figure out what was going on with the language. Um, and I, I was going to go back to something that Mark mentioned. Um, the, one of the things that struck me was the distinction between, say, diplomatic apologies and um, national apologies, sort of historic ones. So the, the diplomatic ones are often um, kind of classically insincere um, and the the sort of apologies for historic harms are, are much more uh, much more of a long-term process. Um, so what I started to notice was that the way that people apologize in public is is really um, fairly defensive. It's it's often a sort of two or three step um, process where they get it wrong the first time and have to come back and do it again. And the non-apology figures into this prominently. Lots of public apologies are these kinds of conditional apologies where I'm sorry if anyone is offended, um, or where they kind of stick what happened and then say, I'm sorry for that, I take full responsibility, let's move on. Um, so there's a, there's a wide range of um, kind of linguistic dodges that people use. Before I get Mark and Cindy to comment on it, let me just ask, is it, is it in relation to how uh, public the transgression is, i.e., for example, Germany has pro apologized profusely for World War II, the invasion of Russia, the Holocaust, the death camps, but Turkey, as example, refuses to apologize for uh, killing off the Armenians, uh, you know, 25 years before that because it's less well-documented, although it is quite well-documented, it's less well-documented than, uh, than uh, the Nazi genocide. And same thing with, like, Japan. Uh, Japan uh, committed atrocities every bit as terrible as uh, the Nazis did in terms of uh, experimenting on people, mass murder, Nanking. Uh, but they haven't apologized. But that seems to have been muted by the fact that they did suffer the two uh, atomic bombings. So... Uh, in, say, a political contest of these big things like uh, genocide and war, it, is, is perception of, of, say, Japan suffering more than Germany or, or Turkey not being as obviously or not well known in, in their guilt as Germany, do these, how do these things factor into the way nations apologize? Yeah, yeah, I think, and, and others may want to weigh in on this too. I, I think you're right that some of this is the the sort of documentation and the, the attention that the world pays to a, a transgression. Um, and some of it too, I think, is the the standing of the group that needs to be apologized to. Um, one of the kind of classic examples that, that I looked at was the uh, apology for Japanese American internment. Yeah. Um, it was a long time coming um, from the 1940s until basically 
a, a period that lasted from 1976 to about 2000, involving five different presidents, um, commissions studying the, the history of what happened, um, Congress weighing in, and so on. So it was really a a long term uh, a long term process. Mark, you wanted to say something. Yeah, actually, I I, I, um, I I forgot what I was I, I was going to say. I'll come back to that. Okay, Cindy, do you have a comment upon uh, you know things that nations apologizing for atrocities? Well, it strikes me that um, it's it's much harder to apologize when you are apologizing apologizing to hundreds or thousands or millions of people, people that are maybe already dead. Um, you know, you're, so for example, in the in the case of the the Japanese internment. Many of those people are not alive anymore. It's their ancestors that you're apologizing to. That is a diverse group of stakeholders who have lots of different perspectives and opinions. Um, I think, you know, putting aside the, the constraints that, you know, being a president, you, you can't say certain things because you'll anger particular constituencies. Putting aside even those constraints, um, I think it would be very hard to issue a public apology that was convincing to all of the people that are ostensibly the targets of that apology. Yeah, and, and that was the point I, that I had. When, when you said, Dan, that well, Japan hasn't apologized, I actually think the, the, the Japanese people would say that they have. Yeah. I mean, one of the things with, with, the, with Japan has been the comfort women, whether yeah. there has been an apology. I don't know how many times you have a prime minister coming forward, and it seems to be it's primarily that issue as opposed to some of the other things that you have. But I think for people, for the Japanese people and the Japanese, various Japanese governments, I think they are convinced they've apologized. And, and, and when some of the things that Edwin said, I mean, when I hear those kind of apologies, of, if anyone's been offended, like, as if to say, I can't believe anyone has been offended, but just in case someone has, I want to apologize. I see that, I mean, I sort of cringe at that, but it, but it seems to be that the people who are issuing this actually sincerely believe that they have apologized. So I think part of the part of this is well, what does constitute a an apology. I mean, one of the some of the work I've done, I sort of set forth what forth what I believe an apology. You know, in other words, here's a template, at least the template that I think could be followed. But I still think a lot of people who apologize or think they're apologizing, even though other observers will think that they have it. And then sometimes the non-apology just makes things worse. Yeah. Right? It seems to me it's just defensive. It's just, you know, these people really can't learn the lesson. And really, you're better off not even attempting in the first place. And also, the victors write the history. And the, the U.S., as far as I know, has never really issued a public apology for slavery or the genocide of American Indians. I don't think the Spanish... Uh, Government has ever apologized for you know wiping out the Incas or the or the Aztecs or, or whatnot, but the three countries I named were all losers in their wars: Germany, Turkey, and uh, and Japan. So we expect them to apologize for quote unquote starting uh, the war. Actually, there has been an apology by the head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, this was about fifteen years ago. But again, notice it's not done by the president. Yeah. It's done by someone else here. So, 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 what's the meaning when it's not the head of state in terms of the political policies? Yeah. yeah. Can we come? Can I jump in? Actually, oh. I think the comfort the comfort women example is a really interesting one, and there are still a number of those uh, of those women alive, and um, quite a lot of money has been transferred to, to Korea to, to make up for that. But that was completely unsatisfying to to those victims, um, and. If I were giving advice, and no one has asked me for it, um, I, I, could, I could imagine that were officials from Japan to sit down in a room and personally talk to these victims, that might be worth more than the millions of, of yen that they've, that they've transferred. Um, and, and I think, again, it sort of points to the difficulties of people acting at the collective level when the wrongs have happened at the personal level. You know, we, how do we bridge those two worlds. Yeah. Uh, Mark, uh, in your book, uh, 
you uh, speak a bit more about political truths. And I've always had a, a, an issue with the idea of truth. Uh, in this politically correct age, you hear individuals always talking about my truth, not the truth, but my truth. And when anyone starts talking about my truth, I know they're lying through their teeth, basically. Uh, and yet nations do it, corporations do it. Uh, you know, you can have the Exxon Valdez, or you can have uh, BP's uh, spill in the Gulf, or not the spill, the what, a, what happened in the Gulf with the oil, uh, or you can have this, that, or the other thing happen. And people will always try to say, well, we thought we were doing this. We had this kind of information. You know, uh, the cigarette companies, you know, will, will tr despite reams of evidence, deny that they knew decades beforehand that uh, smoking would kill people. Um, so what... Uh, what degree does the manipulation of truth play in apologies uh, eventually coming out? Well, I think part of... See, I, I'm with you that I think the apology... Edwin had mentioned about the some of the historic wrongs. I mean, when done well, it's, it is a long-term process, and it is a means of trying to find the truth, as opposed to a victor's truth or a, a, victor's truth or a victim's truth. That part of the process you have would be the, the understanding that that maybe we need to reinvestigate this to see if we can seem to agree on what the truth is. So that's why I think that a, a public apology done right wouldn't assume that there is only one truth. Part of the process here would be to establish this truth as much as could be done by taking in the, the views of a whole host of people. So. Again, I, I would agree with you that it's difficult to say that there is an objective truth, that there's only one truth. I think there's different versions that people have of it, and the apology process should factor in all of these. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 let me just say, go ahead. Well, I couldn't agree more, and I think that's that's really the philosophy behind things like the South Africa's Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission, right, is to bring people forward to tell their stories and um, ideally to develop a common narrative. And I think why that's important is that then when the transgressor does apologize, you actually believe that they know why they're apologizing, right? Yeah, so, yeah I was just going to add, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that these um, processes do is that they, they challenge the sort of old historical narrative and dig into it more deeply so that people can actually identify and speak the harm that was done. Yeah. Now, Cindy, your book uh, doesn't deal necessarily with the wording as much as the timing. Um, and I would think that timing would be dependent upon the degree, uh, uh, the severity of the transgression, i.e., if you come home and you find out that someone broke into your car and stole 50 bucks, that's not going to stick with you as much as finding out that uh, some guy came in and raped your mother or, or, or your daughter. It's going to take a lot longer to forgive the guy who stole 50 bucks than it is uh, the rapist. Uh, uh, am I correct in, in assuming that that plays a part in it? And what else plays a part in timing, if not the degree or the severity of the transgression? Well, one of the things I'm actually really enjoying about this conversation is the things that Edwin and Mark are saying and talking about at the international level um, actually map on quite nicely to what we found in our research at the interpersonal level. Um, and so Edwin was talking about the very long process that uh, went through. I mean, that, that maps on to the work that I have done, um, showing that the um, there needs to be a conversation um, before the apology comes. And that conversation, and so Mark, I'm interested in hearing what your template is for a good apology, but that, uh, that, that conversation um, needs to be something along the lines of the victim expresses um, the wrong that was done and the hurt and why why they are hurt. Um, transgressor uh, articulates that they understand it and convinces the victim that they actually get it and that they're actually sorry. And it's really not until the victim really feels heard and understood that the, that the apology will be effective. And so to come back to your question, Dan, about how does severity factor in, um, if it's a if it's a minor offense, it's going to be easier. I'm not going to need to talk as much about all the harm that was done, and I'm not, I'm going to be easier to convince that, that you um, you get what you did wrong. Um, if it's an extremely severe offense, like a like a violent crime, that could take years or decades, right? Um, and there is such a thing as a too late apology as well, interpersonally. 
And it would be interesting to hear from Edwin and Mark whether they think that's true at the at the political level. Um, but at least there's some evidence at the interpersonal level that if enough time goes by, um, it, the apology actually loses effectiveness. Edwin or Mark, do you have a comment on what Cindy just said? Yeah, I think I hadn't quite thought of it in those terms, but there were a couple of examples that I came across that, that struck me that way. One was um, Kevin William Cowley, yeah. um, who, you know, after the My Live massacre, I think we're all old enough to remember, um, he kind of faded into the woodwork in Georgia and worked at his father in law's jewelry store for years. After he retired, um, he told some friends of the Kiwanis Club in uh, Columbus, Georgia, I think, that he had something he wanted to say, and he apologized for his actions at a Kiwanis meeting. Um, so it was one of those things where he doesn't really apologize to the, the Vietnamese people or the um, sort of descendants of uh, the people affected, but just sort of makes an apology in a, in a really sort of an odd space. Um, and that one struck me as, as sort of particularly poignant because he had clearly been thinking about this for a long time, but it still struck me as being something that could have been done much better. Yeah. Um, the other one that was kind of interesting was um, George H.W. Bush's campaign manager, Lee Atwater. Um, who ran the famous Willie Horton ads against Michael Dukakis and then came down with brain cancer. Um, and when he was dying um, a couple of years after the election, he went around and apologized to a lot of the people he had uh, done wrong. There, there's still a debate about whether he was sincere or just trying to you know, burnish his deathbed reputation. Mm -hmm. So that might be one that uh, is too late, also. Mark. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, timing, is, I think, is is, is essential here. I, it was the Clinton apology. And really, what got me interested in this was the Clinton apology to Guatemala. He's he's taken this tour of Central America. The day before he had been in El Salvador, he didn't make any mention of an apology. But then, unscripted, the next day in Guatemala, and there was a sort of a reaction to this Truth and Reconciliation, and, and, and whatever, the Truth Commission they had in Guatemala, where he he apologizes for support for genocidal regime, but it's done in a very offhand way. I mean, there's no negotiation, there's no, there's, there's nothing. It's really unscripted, it's not in his original prepared remarks. He says it, right, and, uh, and you wonder, well, what's the meaning of this? That, that's sort of what got me involved with apologies to begin with. What, what's going on here? I mean, is, is this the, the start of something monumental, or is this just a an offhand, off-the-cuff remark? And to this day, I don't know. I'm very ambivalent about apologies, yeah. right? I'm very ambivalent. There's a side of me that thinks this is, this is revolutionary, and there's a side of me that thinks this is nothing but a cheap political trick. And on different days, I go in different ways. But there are some apologies that I think are done very well. When I'm asked, you know, what would you say is the gold standard, I would say my usual response is Australia with their apology to the indigenous people. I thought the way it finally was done, the, 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 the procedure, uh, but also the publicity given to that. On the other end would be the kind of the slipshod thing to Guatemala type of thing. Yeah, when Edwin yeah. brought up uh, William Calley, it made me think of probably one of the other great moments, uh, not great in the positive sense, from uh, Vietnam, and that was the, the famous film of uh, the chief of uh, the South Vietnamese police shooting the prisoner in the head, and I was just looking him up, uh, Win Lowen was his name, and I know that uh, he lived another 30 or so years after that, moved to America, opened up a restaurant or two, and yet for, for years after that, he was derided and... and, and no matter how many times that he said that he wished that it had not happened, he was never forgiven, even though it turned out that the fellow he executed was a guy who had committed mass murder. I mean, he didn't give the guy due process, as we know it here in the U.S., but his his uh, apologies were never accepted. So uh, would that be a case, do you think, Cindy, of 
uh, bad timing or that uh, why was sometimes this fellow who seemingly uh, was genuine in his apologies throughout the rest of his life not forgiven and he's become rather infamous even now 40 plus years on. Yeah, you know, I'm actually not familiar with that particular case and so I, I would really want to hear and, and see what did he say when, uh -huh. when he apologized um, because that, I think what makes an apology stick in part is very, very subtle things mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think it, it, it at the interpersonal level can come down to a tone of voice and, and nonverbal uh, expressions that, that we maybe aren't even consciously registering, but unconsciously are communicating important information to us. Um, maybe he just wasn't a good communicator. That, that's one possibility. Um, I think another possibility is that for whatever reason, um, his, his crime was just more, more unacceptable um, to the American people. Well, when you talk yeah, about, but, oh, go ahead. Uh, and I was going to say though. I mean, to me, when you mentioned Ben, we've had we had Cowley, we had. Uh, the, I, I'm with Cindy. I'm not familiar with this, but sometimes what you happens, I think, is you you miss the forest for the trees here. I mean, the, what about the apology for the Vietnam War to begin with? Yeah. What about the apology for Agent Orange? Right. So we have one or two incidents. I mean, I mean, this incident with uh, that famous photo. I would be hard pressed to believe that's the only person he didn't give due process to before summary the summary execution. That we I think what he was sorry about is that there was a photograph that became famous. That is really but but sometimes what happens with apology is you is you you focus in on the minutia, thereby giving the excuse to avoid the much larger issue. And I think in, in terms of Vietnam, and I, I'm not to. Under, underplay the atrocities, either My Lai or, or the summary execution that all of us have seen. But there's larger issues here involving Vietnam, but sometimes we get distracted by the smaller issues. Yeah. Let me talk about two of the more famous uh, public apologies in American politics of the last 50 years, and that's uh, Nixon when he was forced to resign, and then Reagan during uh, Iran-Contra. And both of these seem to me to be variations of the classic non-apology. Certainly, Nixon was far more bulldogish uh, because his apology when he quit, he ended up saying, I am not a crook. And he talked about his mother being a saint and, and whatnot. Uh, and there was very, you know, it was not 1% apology and 99% justification. And in Reagan's case, however many years later, 14, 15 years later during the Iran-Contra thing, uh, what I remember is that they were caught flat-footed, absolutely breaking U.S. law, and yet because Reagan was still popular at the time versus Nixon, who even the Republicans abandoned him, Reagan basically just said he didn't realize it. Uh, his, his apology was, well, I apologize basically, but I had no clue what was going on. So let me just talk about those two types of uh, apologies, the bulldogish non-apology apology of Nixon and the sort of aw shucks apology of Reagan. Uh, do either of them tend to be more prevalent these days or, or what? Uh, anyone of you want to jump in? Well, I didn't think, when you mentioned the apologies, I don't think of either one as an apology. I mean, I, I, I don't remember. Well, well their, their supporters would have said that, that it was an apology. Okay, but I, I don't even, I just, actually, I just don't even remember people framing it in that way. Yeah. But, it, but it, I mean, I, to me, neither one even comes close. Yeah. Uh, Edwin? Yeah, I, I would have to agree. I think uh, there's, a, there's a sort of classic moment in the uh, Frost-Nixon movie where the filmmakers present Nixon as being more apologetic than he actually was. Um, and uh, one of the things I looked at was over the years, there were various statements by Nixon about his resignation. Um, and he was asked if he was going to apologize to the American people at some point. And he, he kept sort of dodging this question. And he would um, talk about, you know, well, I don't think that I could apologize any more sincerely than you know, resigning the presidency. And then at one point, um, later on in an interview, he said something like, if they want me to grapple, I'm not going to do it. So he sort of clearly saw apology as grappling his theories. 
Cindy, do you have a comment on uh, Reagan or Nixon? Well, not specifically about those, but it, it strikes me that, you know, Edmund, you said something really interesting there, which is how, how do we how do we think about an apology? And so uh, Nixon saw it as groveling, you know, oftentimes it's framed as a sign of weakness. Um, and that makes it a pretty high cost behavior for the transgressor to engage in. Um, if basically by engaging in this behavior, um, that would lead you to see yourself in a negative light, that's a pretty strong motivation to not do it. Um, and so, you know, Dan, you've asked about how, how have apologies changed over time and, and asking the question, um, are people less reluctant to apologize? I don't know whether that's true or not. It's hard for me to get a sense of that. But I think um, if, the, if the culture, if the dominant culture defines apologies as weakness or groveling, um, then, yeah, apologies are going to decrease. If, if they're defined as um, acting with honor, right? If, if you can apologize and be a good person, you're going to be much more likely to apologize than if apologizing means that you are, are a weak person. Let me uh, follow up on something that you had said, Cindy, uh, and that's uh, the conversation uh, to happen before an apology. And then I want to expand out from that. What kind of an offense, let's just stick on the personal level now, would demand a conversation, say, before uh, an apology? What type of an offense? So would it be just uh, offending you because I didn't like the color of your dress or your, your lipstick? Or is it uh, that I said that, you know, your mother wore army boots or something? I think um, I think it's hard to it's hard to get specific about that because I think it's very very idiosyncratic to the the people that are involved, um, and I think I think there are situations where an outsider might look at a situation and say, oh, I see exactly why person A is upset, but if person but person A still wants the chance to say why they're upset, um, and so I, I think it's it's less about the specifics and more about um, the, the subjective experience of the victim. I think the subjective experience of the victim is, is, is really key. Um, Mark or Edwin, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I think uh, one of the um, situations that, that sort of reminds me of is, is the importance of the, uh, the person apologizing, having this kind of moral or ethical discussion with the person they're apologizing to. And um, I remember when um, Joe Biden made this sort of odd comment about Barack Obama when they were both up, when they were both um, running for president back in 1990 or 2007. Um, and he talked about him being the first um, African-American candidate who was bright and clean and articulate, I think is what he said. Um, and then he issued a sort of casual apology after that. Um, and Obama sort of accepted it immediately, but then um, Obama and others came back and sort of chided Biden um, for the, the sort of um, tone of what he said and the, the sort of implication that other candidates hadn't been um, hadn't had those qualities. So it sort of led to this um, exploration of Biden's comments, even though I think everybody involved wanted to sort of just get this apology out of the way and move on. Yeah. Um, but, but those are the kinds of conversations um, that, that Cindy's highlighting and that I think have to happen um, in, in any sort of apology for it to, to really mean something. Um. Let me just uh, talk then about, because it seems to me in the last 20, 25 years that uh, apologies sometimes can be used as weapons and sometimes even the person accepting the apology can turn around uh, uh, the apology. I, For example, I, I, I know someone in my own personal life who had transgressed against a person and it was a big transgression and I won't go into it, but uh, the person that they transgressed against accepted ostensibly. And for years though, they rode this person for having done the transgression, even though ostensibly apologizing, to the point that the person who seemingly accepted the apology clearly really didn't and was using this transgression as an eternal club to keep hitting this other person over the head with. Do we see that just on a personal level or do we see that on an international level, political level as well? 
Uh, maybe I'll start with Cindy if you want to start first. Yeah, so I think you're, you're pointing to a very real phenomenon, which is that there are benefits that come with being the victim. And when you apologize, in a sense, you, you're supposed to then at that point give up your victim status, right? right? Because we're now saying, okay, we all agree, yes, you did wrong, but I'm forgiving you. Um, so so you're, you're giving up a, a source of power by doing it. And so it sounds like, you know, this is instance that you're describing, um, the person kind of wanted to have it both ways. They right. wanted to see themselves as being forgiving, and also they still wanted the power that comes with being a victim. Mark? Yeah, I, again, I'm, because I deal with apologies with the millions and the throngs here, it's, uh, I don't know if you see that much of that with the continued victimization uh, forward. I mean, I don't, I don't see a country, someone, uh, let's say the indigenous people in Australia, I don't think you keep seeing this. But what you do have to see is some kind of change, though. Yeah. Right? To me, the, the, the apology is insincere if you just simply want to, issue some soft words, maintain the status quo. So one of the things here that is necessary is a change in conditions. That, that, that actions here speak much louder than words. So the words are just the beginning. It's just the first step. And so, I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think victims should continue to be victims unless this, the apology is insincere and the conditions that have led to the apology in the first place are maintained. Do we have different standards of living and educational opportunities for indigenous people in Australia or not? In other words, if things don't change, then you would have every reason to keep going back and saying, you said things were going to change, and yet they haven't cha changed one iota. Yeah. Edwin, do you have a comment? Yeah, and I was just going to go back to uh, your, your first question and something that uh, Mark mentioned. He uh, talked about the, the idea that... Um, an apology sort of brings someone back into the fold, into society. And when when an apology is made, that's often an opportunity for a group that's been harmed to sort of change their status in society as well, to go from being victims to being um, a, a different sort of partner in, the, um, in society. And I, I think Mark mentioned that some people can make this some people can accept this more quickly than others so in, on the scale of millions there'll be many people who are ready to accept an apology and some who think it's not quite enough or not sincere um, so you're going to have that kind of um, sort of breakup of the people being apologized to uh, I mentioned that an incident where there was a real transgression, but it seems to me that there's also developed a, sort of a cottage industry of perpetual victimization. And a lot of times the offenses that the people claim, uh, most people would see as faux offenses, that there's power to be had by claiming to be offended by this, that, or the other thing. Uh, my senses are offended. You've offended my religion. A lot of people certainly will talk about this with, say, uh, uh, Christianity uh, in terms of gay marriage or, or things like that, uh, that you are offending my senses, that, that you have transgressed against me. Uh, do we, have we seen, say, in the last few decades, the rise of people apologizing or, or people trying to extract apologies from people where there really is an offense really worth apologizing for? Uh, Cindy, I'll start with you again. Sure. Um, I think I, the way that I would interpret stuff like people being offended for saying happy holidays versus Merry Christmas because yeah. that's that's uh, slighting Christianity my perspective on that is yeah you're right they are they are trying to establish victim status but they're mainly doing that because simply because the status quo is, be, is being challenged and they're used to being in the dominant position which is a pretty nice place to be um, and and so they are experiencing victimhood when really all that is happening um, is their dominant status is, is shifting. Um, and so I think that as our culture becomes uh, more diverse, as uh, whites move from the majority to the minority, I think we are going to see more of that. Mark, do you have a comment? Yeah, no, I, I actually think for me it's the opposite, that I think that there are many things for which you wonder why, why isn't there an apology? I mean, I'm kind of I've always been astounded that there hasn't been an apology for colonialism, generally, 
right? You may have an event, right? Again, an event under colonialism, the Amritsar massacre, nineteen whatever in India. You have you have apologies for some of these discrete events, but never the larger thing. And as I mentioned before, sometimes this is a way of avoiding the larger issue. But I, I think that in international relations, it's been pick and choose. It's always, it's puzzling to me what has been apologized for, but what's not apologized for. So I don't think we have this fake victimization. I actually think we've had centuries of a certain way of doing things that has led to some of the, the enormous inequalities we have in the world today. And then we pick and choose a few events and say we're sorry about that and let's just move forward with things. And, I, and that to me is what's problematic about apology, the public apologies here. It's sort of the, it's sort of the, the inconsistent nature of them. Edwin, a comment? Yeah, no, I, I would agree. The, the inconsistency of apologies is really um, pretty striking. And, and you see situations where um, public officials are being called on to apologize for merely misspeaking. Right? Um, so in some cases, people aren't really given the benefit of the doubt. And in, in other cases, there are these historic wrongs that just go unexplored. And one of the things that I've sort of noticed over um, the course of the last few years is that I've become much more selective as an apologizer. Um, I tend to not apologize casually, um, but try and do a better job of apologizing when I really do do something wrong. Yeah. Let me, That's interesting because there, there's a gender thing there too. So women are kind of trained to say, I'm sorry, not when they're sorry at all, but simply as kind of a... Uh, a low status, like, let me smooth the waters. I'm about to say something you don't want to hear, so I'm going to start it by saying I'm sorry. Um, so, so that's interesting. I, I think I also, as I have aged, have become more selective um, in, both, in both saying I'm sorry when I'm not really sorry and, and also in terms of apologizing. Uh, I want to talk politically about apologies and uh, sort of where someone stands in a camp uh, uh, or a position and, and how that affects apologies. And I want to give two his examples, one a current one and one historical. The first one is the historical one. And obviously in the middle 20th century, you know, there was Joe McCarthy and the Red Scare. And I think pretty much everyone will agree that that was a wrong thing to do. Certainly there were communists that worked uh, in the U.S. government here or there. I think things, for example, like uh, the persecution of Alger Hiss by Nixon and uh, his cronies was pretty much not good. Uh, there's very little evidence against him. But by the same token, the far left uh, uh, in the, from the 30s to the 50s continually gave uh, apologism for Stalin, even though we knew about his atrocities equaling or exceeding that of Hitler's. So that's my first example. And the, the, the more recent example would be in recent years with the rise of what we could call Islamism and the treatment of women in the uh, uh, this fundamental uh, Muslim uh, world, which uh, is centuries old. I mean, the, 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 whether it's general mutilation, whether it's the denial of basic rights, the, the, the being forced to wear certain uh, clothing, the, 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 just the daily denigration. And yet here, just like with Stalin, a lot of people on the political left who will talk about the need to be empowered here in the U.S. totally ignore the 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 treatment of women in Islam. So, to what degree does whether you're on the left or the right, or I guess even in the center, affect the way that you view things and the need for an apology, whether it's for Stalin in the past or for Islamic terror against women in this the current age? Uh, Edwin, do you want to go first? Yeah, this is an interesting. Uh, I think. Um, I mean, from what I've read, generally. Um, people on the right are a little bit more resistant to national apologies. Uh, I mean, that seemed to be the case in Australia, in Japan, in Germany, and certainly um, here. Um, and uh, one of the examples, an early example I found with diplomatic apology was um, the apology to Colombia back in the 19-teens. Um, there was a, a treaty drafted, so it was kind of a diplomatic apology. The, uh, 
the Wilson administration had some language in the treaty uh, indicating that the U.S. was sorry that anything had happened to uh, disrupt the friendly relations between Colombia and the U.S. Uh, basically, they are, are thinking of the Panama Canal Zone. Uh, and the treaty was uh, rejected by the Senate. And it, after the next administration, I guess it was that, uh, the Harding administration, I guess, um, it was approved with those words dropped. So even back in the 1920s, there was this um, sense that you know, uh, apologies were being politicized. Mark, do you have a comment? Yeah. I, uh, well, when you mentioned, you gave the two examples here, but I've actually have talked about an apology to women generally, not not just the, the treatment of women by a certain religion, but you could say the treatment of women throughout history wouldn't be a bad it wouldn't be a bad thing to do because it's been in every society, right? It's it's always it's it's it, whether you know. So the example you use with with the uh, with the Muslim faith. Uh, certainly, it's true of, of other religions as well, and it's true of the treatment of women in the United States. But I always maintain in the work I do on religion that there's two ways of looking at it. One is to look at this just as a historic wrong, which I think is easy enough to do. But I think the more important role that I think public apologies should serve is, is to have you consider what you're doing now that you'll be apologizing for in 50 years. In other words, the apology ought not to, it's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Sometimes you'll look back at earlier generations and you think, oh my God, these people were barbarians, whatever. how did they believe this kind of stuff? I think that part is easy. I mean, not that it's always been done well, and what we've been talking about today is how poorly sometimes it has been done. But I think the more essential part of the apology phenomenon, at least from my perspective, is to make us also think of today. What are we doing today? What kind of power relations are we maintaining today that in some time in the future, we also, there will be an apology for it. I always find that that never happens. It's much too easy, much too convenient to talk about Stalin, talk about you know, whatever it is, to look back in the history. So part of the work that I do is to try to say, let's focus also on the present. And I, as I said, that, that to me has been one of the more disappointing aspects of the apologies phenomenon, is that it always stays in the past. Cindy? I, I love what you said, Mark. I, I think that's that's fabulous, and I wish, I wish, I wish the world listened to you more. <laughs> I do too, but no. <laughs> but coming back, Dan, to, to your original question, um, thinking in particular about uh, liberals' reluctance to be critical of uh, women's treatment in, in Islam, um, I think one possible explanation there, one way of thinking about that is um, wanting to be culturally sensitive. And so there's, there's a critique of traditional feminism that, you know, feminism have come into other cultures and been very um, dismissive of women in those other cultures and, and basically given the message, if you don't do feminism like we do, then you're unenlightened and not a feminist. And so I think, uh, I think on the left, there could be um, a desire to not do that, and that might lead to sort of an overcorrection, um, sort of an, a, an excessive cultural relativism um, that that might lead them to be more hesitant to speak up when they should. And I don't know if that's true, but it just struck me as a possibility. Let me just ask this, though, Cindy, and uh, you can know, uh, any of you can jump in. <clears throat> uh, I know, for example, you know, the, the treatment of Native Americans in the Americas generally, as well as within the U.S. borders, uh, you know, is uh, certainly abominable, and uh, I don't think any uh, right-thinking person, right meaning correct, would uh, disagree. However, uh, there is a sort of overcompensation. For example, one of the things that you get uh, going in the other direction is this nonsensical Rousseauian noble savage uh, stereotype, which is still a stereotype. Whereas now, for example, we know that the likely reason that the mammoths and the mastodons and the saber-toothed tigers disappeared was because 
the ancestors of Native Americans were certainly not noble savages that lived in harmony with nature. They, just like every other human being, came in and killed everything that they could get their hands on. And so uh, it, it, it seems to me that uh, the, there's always this sort of swing back and forth between extremes rather than dealing with the general reality. And so uh, I don't know, do, uh, do you agree generally with that idea that I, I guess as I could tie it to apologies is that we always seem to view things through lenses rather than seeing the other side of the, the coin and coming to a, a common center. Uh, I don't know, Cindy, do you want to comment on that? I, I'll, I'll just say, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think you, you said what I was trying to say earlier really quite well. Okay. Uh, Mark or Edwin, a comment? Yeah, I didn't know whether we should apologize for the saber tooth tiger before this <laughs> introduction here. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. I, you know, I think part of the whole part of this thing is the apology phenomenon should be the ability to see the world through the eyes of the other person, both sides. That to me is what's essential about the apology phenomenon, both sides being able to see the world through, the, through lenses other than the ones that they happen to have. Yeah, I think one of the, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm done. No. Oh, yeah, I think one of the things that's coming out in all of our comments is the idea that apologies are much more difficult than uh, people think, and that it really requires kind of uh, digging into what happened and who has the standing to apologize and what's the future going to be like. So it's really the, the kind of beginning of a conversation rather than something that um, is transactional in some way. Here I've apologized, now we're done, I can say. I want to talk, uh, let me uh, ask Cindy, since this probably is more relevant to her work, and then I'll ask the other fellows. Um, to what degree do you think that testosterone has played in apologies, both personally and uh, politically? And by that I mean, even as a young boy, I noticed that women and men socialize asexually with, within their sexes differently. If two women are talking about the cute boy that's sitting three desks away, they're looking eye to eye and they're, did you, did, did, I, I, he looked at you and, and they're connecting eye to eye. Whereas men sit more like at a sporting event, side by side, and they'll be talking about a beautiful woman and they'll say, man, look at her and oh man, and they're looking out abstractly. And so I'm wondering if testosterone as just a drug or, or an influence makes men tend to look beyond and think that maybe apologies are kind of a petty annoyance, whereas with women, an apology is a bridge builder. Well, I, I think we do know that testosterone um, is linked to aggressive behavior. And so um, I will buy the argument that men who um, typically have higher levels of testosterone, uh, in every culture, men are, men are more aggressive, physically aggressive than women. Um, but I'm not... I'm not convinced that that explains um, the, the different ways that men and women tend to relate because I think you can explain that through socialization. You know, women women are taught to, to value relationships. They are taught better how to communicate than men are, um, at least certainly in our modern U.S. culture and, and historically. Men and women are trained from a very, very early age differently. Um, so I, I, I think... I actually did, I've never seen data on this. Um, I think it's not unreasonable to hypothesize that men might be less effective uh, at apologizing because they get less training in um, in being sensitive in in perspective taking. Um, but I I don't think I would attribute that to testosterone. That now the testosterone might make them more aggressive and make them have more things to apologize for potentially. But women can be aggressive too. In, in very social ways. You know, women can be emotionally aggressive. Um, so I'm not even sure that I would say that, um, that there would be a difference there. I think men and women have been trained to express themselves differently, but that both are capable of, of um, being aggressive and, and both are capable of apologizing. Mark, do you have a comment? Yeah, I don't know if it relates to testosterone, but I also do think that for me, the, the apology phenomenon is, is a way of trying to get a different place in the world, right? So, so Bill Clinton, begin, to me, begins the process because he wants the United States to assume a different place in the world that's less bombastic, less aggressive, right? And I think, so the reason he did that 
is that is is to change, the, if, if not the U.S. place in the world, at least the perception of the U.S. place in the world. I'm kind of curious whether Donald Trump will issue a single apology during his tenure in office. And my sense is that it's not. I don't know if it's testosterone, but there's a certain kind of a public image that is trying to be portrayed. And I think for Trump, this goes back to some of the stuff Cindy was saying, that I think that that an apology for Trump would be a sign of weakness, a sign of, of groveling here. Whereas for, for Clinton in particular, I think of all the past presidents, he in particular sees this as a way of trying to get the United States to assume a different place in the world. Edwin? Yeah, I... I I agree, and I, um, one of the things that I think is, is worth um, everybody taking a look at some, at some point is the old movie, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. It's a, a John Ford movie with uh, John Wayne as a cavalry captain. And that's where this expression, never apologize, it's this kind of weakness shows up as a kind of trope in the movie. Um, it gets used about five or six times. Um, and um, if you remember the movie, in the end, Wayne actually takes responsibility for um, the failure of the mission he was on. Um, and uh, I think the, the idea that men shouldn't apologize or that, or that apology is a sign of weakness has kind of been misinterpreted from these sorts of cultural um, images, as um, Cindy notes, and that, you know, People are hearing apology is a sign of weakness, whereas what the movie is actually saying is taking responsibility is a sign of strength. Uh, let me bring up the subject of anonymity and apology. We live in the internet age, and certainly when whether people are arguing about sports figures or celebrities or politics or, or science or anything, any website that has a comment section you will see the worst behavior from people. And I attribute this to the mask effect that if you're anonymous, you can say, you know, fuck, 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 your mother sucks, blah, blah, blah. And no one's going to hold you accountable, no matter how delusional your argument sounds like. And very few people will ever apologize. And uh, even, even when, you know, someone can absolutely be right. I remember back in, I think, 07, 08, when I was on a, a political blog, uh, I wasn't arguing the differences between the policies of Obama and Hillary Clinton when they were running, but I, I pointed out, for example, that uh, people who said that Hillary Clinton had more political experience, I said, what do you mean by that? Because at that time, Obama had spent exactly 12 years in public service, elected public service, Clinton only six. And I said, so he has literally doubled the amount of elective ex experience if you're going to do that. And of course, uh, a woman there uh, accused me of being uh, anti-woman. And I said, well, I could just as equal, equally argue you're a racist, but I didn't. Uh, and I didn't get any apology for, for her, her fallacious claim. But let, let's talk about uh, the anonymity of the internet too. And has that made apology superfluous, uh, at, at least online? Uh, anyone want to jump in? Well, I think I think it, the first step here. I think um, these these online relationships are very impoverished relationships, right? So um, you don't you don't even know people's names. You don't know what they look like. You could never even talk to them again, even online. You certainly don't have to see them in the grocery store or or interact with them on a daily basis. And I think um, that 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 means. Why should we bother to apologize? Because we, we don't have that that relationship. We don't have that in group that we are trying to maintain um, our status in. It just doesn't. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't cost us anything to not apologize. Whereas when you are, you know, in a real relationship with someone where you're interacting with them over time, um, there is a cost to not apologizing. You damage the relationship. Um, so that that's one way of looking at it. But Cindy, couldn't someone argue that the apology is for the person who has transgressed as much as that transgressed against? So you would lose that, no? Yeah, that's a good point, point. Um, and and that was the thought I had in our earlier conversation um, when you were you were describing um, Ali apologizing to the Kiwanis Club. That struck me as an apology that was much more for him than for anybody else. Um, so yeah, that's true. Um, but I but somehow I think that. 
an apology takes work. And if you don't need to bother to do work, you know, if you can get away with not doing work, I think, you know, we tend to be lazy. A marker, Edwin? Yeah, I was just going to, you know, it occurred to me that public figures and celebrities are pretty bad at apologizing. And, you know, on the internet, we're all celebrities on our Facebook page. So there's an audience out there that we really don't know, and we don't know how they're going to react to our apology. But if you and I have a relationship and I do something to harm you, you know, I have a, a feeling of what our relationship is and what it will take to repair it. On the internet, I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Well, Edwin, would you, though, agree, though, that an apology is also something that eventually should or could be good for the person who has transgressed as well as the person they're apologizing to? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think it, um, it can bring somebody, it can prepare a relationship. Mark, uh, a comment from you? No, I don't read comments. <laughs> I, 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 I go through life trying to avoid uh, distress, and even if I get an email I don't think I'm going to like, I don't read it. So I, I, I must, I must, but I know what you mean, Dan. I mean, it seems to be that whether it's this like um, talk radio, sports radio, and all that. I mean, I just find it very uncomfortable the way people, the way people talk about one another. I mean, I think I went into human rights because. I was so highly offended as a kid with bullying, and this to me just seems to be another form of bullying. So in this case, if you can't if you can't control it, uh, you can't prevent it. But I, I don't even engage in it. I mean, I really don't. I just think it's I think it's childish behavior. Well, I want to wrap this interview up, and in the final segment, I want to give you each a, a final uh, comments and say so on where. Uh, apology stand now and what you think uh, maybe the next decade or so will bring in terms of political stuff. But I do want to end this segment with a, a, a personal anecdote and just get your opinions about it because uh, we talked, I just asked you about the internet and it seems to me that a lot of internet behavior has leaked into real life, if you want to call it that. And uh, a few years ago, I was at a job where I was a trainee and uh, I had uh, the trainer who I found out was training me quite wrongly on some things and when the errors that I had been trained to do, I, I did the errors correctly as I was trained, but when they came to light, uh, I was the one basically quote unquote thrown under the bus and uh, and I, I was the one who got in trouble and was written up and the, the trainer came to me a, a few days after the incident and said to me, uh, you know, uh, uh, you really shouldn't have been the one who got in trouble. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry for that. And I, I said to him, because we were the only two people uh, there at the time uh, at the office, and I said, well, there were only two of us, so if not me, who should have? And he didn't say anything. He just sort of walked away. He wanted, I know he wanted me to say, well, I forgive you. It's no big deal or whatnot. But uh, he, he, he couldn't really utter uh, an apology. I mean, he, he said, I'm sorry, uh, 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 sort of in the abstract, and it, it occurred to me that that was very much an internet-type uh, real-life encounter. Do we, do, have any of you, like, seen that kind of thing that 20 or 30 years ago would not have happened, uh, or is that something that the internet has just propagated that was always there? Uh, let me start with Edwin. Yeah, I think the internet has actually made it more um, accessible more obvious, but those sorts of apologies have been around for a long time. Um, people really kind of saying, you know, I'm sorry, that's just the way I am. The apology's not accepted. You sort of come back to it again. Uh, a lot of apologies are sort of two or three step apologies, and, and historically that's um, it, it's often been the case, but it's not really publicized as, as widely as it is in today's kind of media-heavy um, society. Yeah, it's sort of like seeking absolution without the apology. Mark, do you have a comment? Do you think that that's something that's always been, has it been intensified by the Internet, or do you think it's just an Internet phenomenon that's leaked out? Yeah, that one I don't know, and I'm not on social media. <laughs> so, but what I, what I do maintain, one of the things I, again, in my writings on apology, is I think my, pref my strong preference is always forgiveness. Right, because the apology, it's the, the apologizer, the, the transgressor, who continues to hold the power 
whether there is an apology given or not, right? And so that dynamic doesn't change so much. So, so to me, the preference would be to, to seek forgiveness. Because, and then the other side has to decide whether to grant the forgiveness or not. So what concerns me about the apology is that the dynamic here with the transgressor here and the victim here oftentimes is perpetuated in the entire phenomenon of whether an apology will be given and what it will be said. I, what, I think that the importance of the apology is to transform that. And so I don't know how that happens on the internet. I have no idea how that happens on the on Twitter. I, I don't think of those as the best manifestations for an apology. They seem to be a very good way of insulting people. I think the president <laughs> has shown that in spades. It's a very good way of insulting people, but I don't think that's the medium that ought to be used to try to, to, to address a wrong. How about you, Cindy? Do you think that the internet has heightened... Uh sort of faux apologies or the seeking of absolution without an apology, or is that something that's been around since forever? And Well, just just one follow-up on, on Mark's comment about forgiveness. There's actually a lot of great research showing that there is benefit, both physical and psychological benefit, to forgiving. Um, so, so being able to forgive someone is, is a good thing. Um, to come back to your question, Dan, I think I'm, I'm with Edwin that these, these kinds of apologies have probably already existed. Um, certainly, internet culture is going to leak into um, other parts of culture, and so it's, it's conceivable to me that, that these things are on the rise more. But I also want to remind us that um, that humans are really flexible and adaptive, and so we, we may behave one way in one particular context. Um, but very, very differently in another context. So we don't want to assume that just because people are behaving this way on the internet, that it is necessarily um, taking over the way that they're behaving in, in other social contexts. Well, let's uh, end this segment in the final segment. I'll just get your final thoughts uh, on the future of apology as well, and we'll do that in a moment. I have been talking about uh, apologies, the human will to do or not do it, uh, with three people who've written on the subject. Uh, I want to just get final uh, thoughts uh, about apologies and uh, where society may be heading from them. But uh, let me start with Edwin and then go Mark and Cindy. Uh, one thing I did not address was, uh, how does one apologize for a feud where the original transgression is maybe lost? And this could be on the Hatfields and McCoy level, or it could be on the uh, Israeli Arab level. And where do you see the future of public apologies at least going? Uh, Edwin first. Edwin? Did we lose him? He Hello? seems frozen in time. Oh, oh, no. Okay, Edwin, did you hear my question? I did, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how I would approach an apology where the original transgression has been lost. That's an interesting question. Um, but I guess my, my sort of final thought is that one of the things that I hope people take away from uh, our, our conversation is just the importance of paying attention to the language of public apology and also the, the sort of background of apology. What's implied in the way it's done? Do people try to jump right to asking for forgiveness or are they willing to really explore the transgression and put a name on it? Um, so I think that's the important thing for me. Okay. Uh, Mark, uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, apologies when it involves a feud where the, the beginnings have been lost? And what are your, feud, what are your thoughts on uh, public apologies uh, in the next decade or so? Yeah. I, I, I think if, the, if, if it's been lost, I don't think it was probably that important anyway. So what I deal with in international relations there are wounds that seem to be open for centuries, right? And these are, these are real wounds, and I think that, so it, it very seldom have has the transgression been lost. In some ways, I think they've been magnified because they have never been addressed. So I think that in international relations, you don't have the problem of the disappearing transgression. You have the magnification of the transgression, and you also then have sort of the, the manifestation of it at the present time. Where I think it will be going is, I think you'll have, I, again, I think it becomes, it, it has almost become a knee-jerk reaction in a 
it's not just in politics. It's it's if a ball player does something in professional sports, we are always expecting the apology to come forward. Right? It's, and so it's it's very seldom to me now do we have a transgression, at least publicly, where what doesn't follow is some kind of public apology about this. The, the real question, I think, though, is is the degree of sincerity here. I mean, are we just saying a few soft words to move on, uh, which to me would probably comprise about 95% of the public apologies to be given, right? Is this just a way of, you know, let's end this thing, and the only way we're going to end this is by issuing some kind of apology. So I think that, as I mentioned before, I still think that what we have to think about is more the future, more the present, but also the kinds of things we're doing in the future. And until we do that, we're going to be fated to keep apologizing for decades and centuries to come. I think the key here is to cre try to create a world where we don't have to apologize. Yeah, you know, uh, when you said that, Mark, I, I thought of all of the like sports apologies where some jock either is carrying a gun or caught with uh, some drugs yeah. or maybe slapped his girlfriend too hard. And then you get these sort of corporate entities, the, the NFL yeah. teams or whatnot, run by these fat these fat cats who probably have done 10 to 100 times worse than the, the dumb athlete, and yet they're, they're forcing them to apologize. And so you get this idea that the guy, the guy isn't really apologizing, but someone there is trying to force him to apologize, and it's just so insincere. Yeah. Uh, Alex Rodriguez of the Yankees, formerly of the Yankees, yeah. uh, this handwritten note where, you know, <laughs> he's, uh, I mean, it's someone probably said to him, Alex, you got to look sincere, and the best way to do that is to write out a, you know, a handwritten note like a school child. Yeah. And, and you're sorry that, you know, for the third time or so, you've been caught using steroids. Like yeah. that. I think that's kind of crazy. Yeah. You know, well, Cindy, uh, what is your thoughts on feuds where maybe the original uh, transgression has been lost, and what do you see as, uh, you know, in the next decade or so, apologies either interpersonally or publicly? So, yeah, the Hatfield McCoy kind of situation is, is the level that's like to study, and I think it very well can happen that transgressions get lost, or at least the stories get so warped from reality that who knows what really happened. Um, mm -hmm. I think. What, what Edwin and Mark have, have said that I'm, I'm just going to say it in a slightly different way is that in that situation and in apologies in general, it really is about transforming the relationship. Um, and I think I'll just leave with the observation that um, I think we often want apologies to be quick fixes. And they, a good apology isn't a quick fix. A good apology is actually hard work. Um, and, and I think... Until we understand that, we will, as Mark said, continue to need to apologize. Um, but if we put our effort into transforming the relationships, transforming the power structures that are causing um, harm, that that is when we will need to apologize less, and and also probably be better at doing it. Yeah, I, I I was just thinking too about when I gave my anecdote how a person can apologize on a personal level. But it doesn't really mean anything unless they take the apology or take the approbation or, or, or the, the disapproval, rather, of uh, or, or the penance of the, the people that they really actually need to apologize or come clean to. But anyway, uh, Cindy, uh, Mark, and Edwin, I will link to their websites or their web pages below this video so anyone who uh, watches this video can contact them. I just want to thank you for taking some time to speak about this. You're welcome. Thank you. It was a pleasure.